Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Jennifer Phillips, who's Director of Transportation at Riviana, Zach Dale, who's Supply Chain Continuous Improvement Manager at Riviana, and Tom Moore, who's a partner at Transportation Warehouse Optimization. And today we're going to talk about using optimized load building to reduce transportation costs. Now, finding available trucking capacity is often a, a challenge, especially when demand is high. The sad truth, however, is that a lot of capacity gets wasted too. We see this, for example, uh, you know, a lot when uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, backhauls that happen every day, as an example, in empty miles. There's another form of wasted capacity, however, that many shippers overlook, and that is wasted capacity due to sub-optimized load plans. Simply put, trailers are leaving facilities not fully loaded to the maximum legal capacity. So why is this happening? What benefits can companies achieve by addressing this challenge? And how can technology help? Well, those are some of the key questions that we're going to address in today's episode. And it's great to have uh, Jennifer, um, uh, Zachary, and Tom uh, to share their insights and advice on this topic. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Good to catch up, Adrian. Uh, it was good to have you with a thought leader. Great. Well, certainly appreciate the uh, you, all of you making the time because I think this is a very you know imp important topic. You know, we, we um, you know whenever I talk to transportation professionals, supply chain professionals, they're always looking for opportunities to uh, you know drive efficiencies in their operations, reduce costs, and, and find find ways to contribute to the business in, in positive ways. And I think this is an area that you know, is, is, a, is a missed opportunities for, for many companies and, and an area that they need to be focusing on more. Um, so Jennifer, let, let's start with you. Um, I'm, you know, many people might be familiar with Riviana. Some people may not be familiar with the company. So before we dive into this topic, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about the company, your plan, you know, a little bit about your planning and, and logistics operations and, and your role at the company. <laughs> All right, I will do. So my name is Jennifer Phillips, Director of Transportation at Riviana. So Riviana Foods is part of Abro that's based out of Madrid, Spain. Um, so it's a global company. We're in, we're all over the world. So um, big presence in, in all over the place. But in the United States, you'll know us best as our Carolina, Mahatma, Minute Rice, Success Rice, all the ready to serve mini, Minute Rice Little Cups. Um, then we get into specialties with rice select like couscous and blended rices and red rice and all kinds of wild rice. And then we have some ethnic ones and such like Tilda and others. So it's quite diverse. So our sales were over a billion dollars last year just in rice products, which is pretty good for, for only selling rice, right? So the complexity there is that, you know, you get everything from rice, um, cups that are very airy, lightweight, um, to cases of 320 pound bags of rice in them, right? So, so we have a broad range of pallet weight, um, stuff that's, you gotta be careful how they're stacking it, et cetera. So the other thing Memphis does as well is supplies all the minute rice to our sister company in Canada, Riviana Foods Canada. So all minute rice sold in Canada is shipped from the Memphis plant. So they're a pretty big operation for us. They ship boxcar intermodal, um, truckload of course, hardly any LTL. There's some customer pickup for some industrial sales and food service. But other than that, it's, it's mainly boxcar, a lot of intermodal and truckload. So over 10,500 shipments last year out of the Memphis plant. So that just kind of gives you the scale of it. Yeah, no, but very, very, very interesting. You know, certainly a lot of diversity in, in the, the the types of products that you're shipping, and certainly, you know, uh, you know, uh, complexity also in, in the operations itself. Um, being Cuban, I eat a lot of rice, so I am a big uh, uh, fan of of, uh, of your products and contribute to some of those, uh, you know, uh, among your best customers, if you will. <laughs> um, so, so let's let's get now into the topic, uh, Jennifer. Maybe you you can kick us off here. You know, we titled the episode "Using Optimized Load Building to Reduce Transportation Costs." So, with regards to load building, and I think you you kind of ref, you kind of alluded to it a little bit in in your introductory remarks there. But with with regards to load building, I mean, what were some of the business challenges or improvement opportunities that you were looking to address? So, if you remember, fuel in the middle of 2022 started skyrocketing out of control. 
our cost per hundred weight was going up. We also were not near the industry standard in average weight per load for solid truck loads of all pallets, you know, all maximizing the maximum weight per load. So we were below industry standard. We kept tracking that and our cost per hundred weight just kept going up. And that's, that's our big factor there. So again, like I said, we've got light and heavy, heavy things going on. So we needed to find a way to challenge what we were setting as the max weight per load um, in SAP to be able to build loads um, or in, in our planning system to, to build truckloads to go out to the distribution centers. Um, part of it's due to the loader turnover, um, the lack of any pallet patterns. Loaders get a load, they just go and they pick it and put it on the trailer any way they want. Um, so lack of dunnage or wrong dunnage spacing, maybe heavy on top of light, et cetera, those type of things. Not turning pallets, loading them straight in. So we ended up with a lot of damages at the DC, a lot of, a lot of rework at the DC. There were a lot of times that we would get uh, trailers back over axle because they're with such a broad range of pallet weight that they're loading. It was at the mercy of each loader to just, they're out there just loading a load. And, uh, you know, Memphis is a seven day operation. So it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there's a lot of different loaders training and, you know, the turnover and all of that is, is difficult when you're dealing with those many variables. Um, so that was the main thing. And then the other, of course, was we're tracking sustainability with Abro in Spain. And so of course, with the emissions and reducing the number of loads and, and the savings, not only in freight costs um, and in cost per hundred weight, but also in the sustainability side of the arena. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, the challenges you, you brought up, I think are common for, for many companies because I hear, you know, same type, types of things, particularly when you've got a you know, diversity of products um, and, you know, sometimes you're being driven by, you know, we just have to, you know, we have to get the product out and, you know, uh, the, the, you know, in terms of having a consistent process in place or some kind of discipline in place to find to be able to do it in the most efficient and effective way possible is, um, you know, something that is lacking in, in, in many companies. I think the other aspect is, you know, you brought up sustainability. And I think that's another area that we're hearing a lot more from shippers as well. That's driving a, a, a lot of initiatives around transportation management, considering the role that transportation plays in carbon emissions and just in, in being able to achieve the sustainability goals that companies have. Um, Zach, before we, I bring you into the conversation, I wanna, I wanna go over to Tom real quick, um, you know, just, just to talk a little bit about the, the technology side of things. I mean, uh, a lot of companies have, ex, you know, there's a lot of existing supply chain logistics software out there, whether it's transportation management systems or planning systems or ERPs. I mean, what have been the main constraints or, or limitations to solving this load building, you know, optimization challenge before? and what new capabilities are available today, today to help companies, you know, optimize their loads more effectively? Now, one of the problems, Adrian, is this is a very complex issue. Okay? You now, what stacks on what? Jen mentioned this. You know, new loaders don't know that they you, you don't put the bricks on top of the eggs. Um, you know, how much weight do the actual physical wood pallets add to the load? What if can these things stack wide, wide in the trailer? Can we double stack this item and not double stack that item? You know, all these various things. And then you throw into it uh, our patchwork of different legal requirements around the country for where the axles can be placed to get the load legal. So you know, it's one thing to maximize a load. It's another one to maximize a load, show how it can be loaded and make sure it's legal. And as Jen pointed out, damage free because there's no value in, in shipping something that's going to get damaged. So, you know, you compound that, and Jen's done a good job of negotiating contracts with trucking companies that have lightweight equipment. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a, a we've got infinite amount. We've only got a finite amount of that. So we need to build certain number of loads to, to match out with the higher weight for those trucks, and then the lower payload weights for the for the balance of the trucks. So there's a constant set of challenges that you're, you're dealing with. And, and complexity is, is one of these things that people have said, oh, we'll just, just keep it simple. Unfortunately, simple 
uh, does cost you a lot more money in the long run. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I've been following, you know, transportation management technology and practices for going on 20, over 24 years now, and it never ceases to amaze me. I mean, you look at the whole life cycle of transportation management. I mean, you just pick one area, this one area, load building, you realize just how complex and how much, how many, how much variable variables go into it to, to, you know, to do it right. And that's, this is just one aspect of the whole end to end process, but this one aspect can have a ripple effect like you said, like, you know, Jim brought up before and you reiterated, you know, it can have a ripple effect on, you know, the, the damages, right. Which again, is an, an additional cost there. It can have a, a ripple effect on, on the warehousing staff and rework that's required and so forth. Um, and I, I think, you know, I think both of you have done a nice job to kind of underscore the complexity that's involved in this load building process. And, you know, obviously this is a, uh, an area where, yeah, you can try to do it with an Excel spreadsheet, but as we've all learned over the years, you know, Excel is just not going to cut it when you have so many variables and ideally you want to optimize, you know, you want to leverage the power of optimization and technology, you know, to do it right. Uh, and, and not only do it right, but also do it, lead, you know, follow the, the regulations that are involved with, you know, um, tru you know truck weights and, and things like that. So, um, you know, very fascinating. So Zach, let, let me bring you into the conversation now. Um, you know, when when kind of embarking on this journey, I mean, what were the some of the the key objectives or, or metrics that you wanted to improve? And as you started looking for technology solutions, I mean, what factors ultimately led you to transportation warehousing optimization? Sure. Yeah, um, Jen covered some of this, so I'm going to re reiterate some of what she said. But um, our main objectives and metrics: sustainability, freight spend, um, the load quality the loader turnover and training and knowledge, um, as well as damage reduction. So what kind of led us in this direction? We were working on a warehouse op or automation project, um, which was separate from this. And within that project, our consultant showed us what our load uh, weights looked like and how you know they were kind of all over the place, overall lower than the standard, um, which I think we, we had some idea of, but the tool at, that we were using at the time it was not robust enough for what we needed for our range of weights, products, um, sizes. So it really only maximized to a certain weight um, level, not necessarily legality. So didn't take into account axles, um, stackability, uh, product dimensions. So um, it really wasn't what we needed to fully maximize uh, the trucks. So Having that in the back of my mind when I was doing research for sustainability, um, one of Rivianna's big objectives, um, I, I came across an article which featured Auto O2, um, which explained, you know, their their product allows for fewer trucks, therefore less emissions, um, which improves the sustainability. Um, so through that, I and with the knowledge of our weights per load from the previous project, um, I started researching Auto O2. Um, found out not only can they help us become more sustainable, but also can fulfill those other objectives, um, the loading, the quality, the spend. Um, so really, it, right off the bat, I, it looked like a great fit um, just from the initial research. Um, and throughout the process, um, it was just reiterated how, how well of a fit it was going to be for Riviana um, because like Jen was saying, we're, we're having issues with loading. I mean, the loaders were using the knowledge that they had of the product um, and that was about it. So go load this, they know, well, this is heavy, it should go on the bottom. Um, so we were running into, like Jen said, the, the axle issues. Um, so really auto to uh, fit with Riviana um, and really um, fulfill each one of those objectives. Um, and overall, we went with uh, with Auto2 because of the team. So Tom and his team and their experience with large CPG companies um, for many years, their proven success. Um, the team was very flexible um, and made a lot of customization for Riviana, which was really great. Um, they took in suggestions you know, for, from the team, from the warehouse team on how to make the tool the best that they could for, for them and easiest to use. 
So really the communication, the experience, um, and really the, the offerings from Auto02 um, led us to partner with them for this project. Great. I mean, I think what strikes me is that, you know, the, the business case of the value proposition was multidimensional. Um, so it wasn't just predicated on just, um, you, you know, the load building aspect of it of what you would think load building, but, you know, you had the sustainability, you had, uh, you know, these other, you know, aspects to it as well. So uh, I can imagine that from a business case standpoint, you know, you, you were able to develop a strong um, ROI model, if you will, a business case, you know, for, for, for this investment. I think the other thing that struck me that you said was uh, as part of the, your partnership um, with, with Tom and, and, and transportation warehousing optimization is the, you know, the ability to bring in the input from the people in the front lines of us, you know, to make it, you know, um, uh, fit or align with their expectations, how they work and so forth, you know, and, and I think that's always a, that's always an important thing because sometimes, you know, you have to get that buy-in from the end user, you know, to, to, to use this. Um, and, and being able to listen to their needs or, or the questions that they have and their input to make it align to, to their day-to-day -day work. I, I sounds, uh, sounds like it was an important part of this. So, so let, let's just stick with you there for a second. I mean, can, can you tell us a little bit about how you went about implementing the solution? Uh, maybe what have been some of the benefits, you know, to date, any unexpected benefits? Yeah, absolutely. So to start the project off, um, we assembled a cross-functional team. So we had IT, obviously, uh, operations planning, transportation, distribution, the plant warehouse team, the plant management team, plant engineering. So we made sure to include someone from every aspect of the supply chain. So we really could understand the impact across the network. You know, um, For example, we included distribution because well, now we're mixing more product on the truck. So we need to make sure that they understand the impact. Um, we understand if it will be an impact for unloading. Um, and just situations like that, we tried to um, include, like I said, someone from each team. So we understood every, every aspect that was going to be affected. Um, an important piece from the start was we, we ensured that everyone um, understood the reason for this project, the importance of the project, um, and overall just why we're, why we're doing this, why we're making this pretty big change for the warehouse. Um, and that was a key aspect of this. So um, from the, like, like you said earlier, from the front line to management, everyone understood what, what we were doing, why we were doing it, and the importance of um, you know, following the process, following the loading diagrams, et cetera. So um, that was the first step. And then IT um, got the systems communicating um, fairly quickly, um, and that went well and smoothly um, with the teams. And then once the communication was implemented, the team um, went through several test scenarios. We included everyone from the team I explained earlier. So everyone understood, you know, every aspect of it. So the management understood the loading diagrams as well as the loaders. You know, everyone understood each piece so they knew how it all fit together and worked together. Um, and through that, we went um, through the go live. Um, Tom and his team were great support, 24-7 support, and continue to be. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize earlier, um, I explained their flexibility. It was really, it really benefited Riviana. It was a big asset to us, that flexibility. Um, even little things like adjusting the loading diagram, um, adjusting, you know, taking out a button click here or there, and um, just making the system as best as it can be for Riviana and as smooth as it can be. Um, and the go live went very well. Um, right off the bat, we saw a 4% increase in weight per load almost instantly. Um, the return, you know, was months, not years. Um, the return was very quick. And um, overall, it just, I think it went really well. Um, and we saw, like I said, we saw the uh, impacts and the metrics improve pretty rapidly. You know, that's, uh, that, that's great. So, go ahead. If I can Adrian. add a bit there, Adrian, we, we need to give a little shout out to Zach too, because he did a lot of, uh, I'll call it tribal knowledge adjustment. Okay. There was a ton of, you know, we've always done it this way, or trucks can only haul this amount of weight. And, you know, it's amazing when you go out and get data, like he had them run 
uh, trucks over, empty trucks over the scale to see how much their payload could be. And, and so he's done a number of things to, to, to gently bring this, the team along and get them to a point where they can say, yeah, uh, you know, we do it this way because it's the right way to do it, not just because we've always done it that way. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think that's, that was going to be my takeaway too, because, you know, sometimes it can be, and I've seen this happen in other organizations where if that communication, that education process is not done right, if you don't get the buy-in or the input from the cross-functional team, it quickly becomes, this is a transportation project, right? And it's like, what's in it for me? Or why should we be doing this? And it sounds like you, you know, put the process in place to really um, not make this a transportation project, but make this a Riviana project, right? This is for the benefit of the entire business and why we need to be doing this. And there's going to be benefits, yes, from a transportation standpoint, but it's going to be benefits in the warehouse as well. It's going to be benefits from the sustainability goals at the corporate level, so on and so forth. So it sounds like you did a nice job there in, in terms of, of educating and, and getting that buy-in from all the critical stakeholders at, at the company. Uh, Tom, um, you know, I think it's tempting sometimes to think, well, maybe this is this type of solution is only applicable for, you know, the big companies, you know, the big shippers, or maybe, you know, uh, uh, companies that have that, that, that the complexity of, of a Riviana. I mean, is, is this, you know, what's what's the sweet spot for, you know, this type of solution? I mean, is this this applicable for midsize and smaller companies, too? It, it is. And, and, you know, Traditionally, it's been the progressive thinking big companies that have adopted this. They are the Unilevers of the world. Okay? And, and as you mentioned, you know, yes, there's benefits to be gained. Uh, you know, Jen mentioned they're doing about 10,000 loads a year out of Memphis, and they're getting significant benefits. And I, I think I heard probably for the first time the payback was months. Uh, they don't generally tell vendors what the payback is. So uh, you know, uh, 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 you know good, good news for them. Um, the, the overall question though is, is what, what's the kind of the break-even point, okay? And I'd say the break-even point's about 5,000 loads on an annual basis, which is about 100 loads a week. Uh, so, you know, is, is that valuable? Yes. And, and it's also important to, to recognize that, you know, while transportation management systems are called management systems, they really are only doing things once they have the shipment. So it's really in that bridge between the planning system and the execution system where load building falls. And, and we have to, to, to work on that, make sure that bridge is, is effective, not just for the planning solution, but also for the, the execution piece, which goes all the way down to the loader, which you know, Zach and Jennifer were talking about. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's great, uh, great insight there. And you know, I, I often talk about that. Sometimes some of the biggest opportunities um, in transportation management are in those white spaces. And, and I think this is one of those examples of of a white space that um, you know is not well addressed by some of these other enterprise systems that companies have in place. That um, you know helps to bridge that gap, if you will, and and be able to deliver these types of benefits. Um, so, so as a way to wrap up, and maybe Zach, we'll, we'll we'll start with you, Jennifer. You know, bring you back into the conversation here and get your thoughts as well. And Tom, you can you can wrap us up. Um, I mean, what words of advice or recommendations would you give to you know other companies that are just getting started on this journey? So, Zach, why don't you kick us off there? Sure. Yeah, um, I think it's important to know where you are at today. The as is, um, really understand what's going on in your business, in your, in your uh, supply chain, to, to understand the benefits that a project like this can give you. Um, and I think, um, as I explained how we, how we went about this project, it's important to include everyone from the start, and that's everyone, um, the warehouse staff up to director, director level, plant management. Um, and it really helps with buy-in if you, give them time to explain their concerns, um, explain their thoughts on the project, on the solution. Um, I, just, I just think that's one of the most valuable things that we did um, because as Tom was saying, it's, it's tough sometimes to get 
the teams to change their ways of doing things. They've been doing the same thing 24 seven for how many years, you know? So that's, that's a huge challenge to start off with changing something like this. So um, just involving everybody and listening, I think are very important. Um, and, you know, just having the open communication um, again is, is just very important. Great, Jen. Uh, any uh, Jennifer, any any thoughts or things you would like to add to that? Yeah, I think it's it was critical having you know Zach boots on the ground, Tom's team boots on the ground in Memphis. You know, our IT team that was working on this was in Spain. So you know, there was there's parties all across the world that were working on this. So you know, getting the timing of meetings and all those things, um, coordinating that, but just the level of just from the people in the shipping office in Memphis saying, hey, could we do this? Can you make this happen? Um, and sure, we can customize that. Yeah, that's a great idea. You know, just the flexibility that um, Tom's company allowed us with the product. It's not a one out of the box and here it is. And that's what you deal with, right? And it, you're not paying every time you ask for a little change before CoLive to make it even better. The nice thing now is, is that now we're looking, we're challenging the weights now. Can we increase them even more on these? Because uh, we haven't had any over axles and we haven't had this and load condition looks good. So we're tweaking the max weight per load now up, especially on some of that ultralight equipment. Um, you know, we have to look between intermodal and dry vans. You know, of course the intermodal boxes are a little heavier, but you know, the, the California bridge laws and all, so those type things. So. We continue to tweak it, and um, I think that the savings, you know, the savings are, are supposed to be over a million dollars a year just in, in this one plant. So, you know, now we're looking at what about our Freeport, Texas plant? Who's next, right? So where else can we use this and take advantage of it for the increased weight per load, better load quality, better condition of the product, all of those things, easier to train, and of course, affecting the sustainability. Great. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you've gotten a lot of learnings uh, already from this, you know, first rollout and now, you know, obviously uh, have the opportunity to expand, you know, these learnings and th this, this opportunity to the other, you know, facilities as well. Um, Tom, uh, wrap it up with you, uh, based on your experience, not only with Riviana, but with other companies you work with, you know, words of advice for folks that are just getting started on this journey. Well, first of all, I think Zach nailed it. Um, he said, you got to understand where you are right now. Um, one of the things that we've done with prospective customers is to say, okay, give us some data and we'll run it and see where could you be? So we know where we are, where we could be, what's a great, what a great situation. And, and then you can start to understand, you know, how, how big the prize is. You know, we've, we've done a lot of these implementations in a lot of companies and, and you know, one size does not fit all. And you got to manage around the, the real world constraints, and you got to make people um, feel that, that their input is is important, which it is. Um, the main planner who does all this at the plant is a lady by the name of Venus, and a shout out to Venus because she's just fantastic. And, and, and by the way, just as a, as a side note, I was actually spent time on site because Memphis is not far from where I live. Uh, I think they got about the worst installer that we have in the company. It was me because I'm. I think I've only done it personally a couple of them in, in, in the years. Uh, so they, they probably got the worst experience. But you know, it really does help to have a good working relationship and a good um, back and forth with all the parties. And and you know, you said, well, why are we getting plant engineering involved? Why are we getting these guys involved? Because they all had input and it was valuable input. So. <laughs> Summary, there's a lot of opportunity here. Let's understand how much that opportunity is. And then once we understand that opportunity, let's work as a team to go and get it and, and get it implemented in a way that you know, brings money to the bottom line. And I gotta say, I'm delighted and, and happy that it was months of pay be, you know, before you were you know, back into, into real positive cash flow. It's a fantastic uh, testimony. Great. Well, I, I think we covered a lot of ground today. Um, you know, first of all, congratulations on the success story. 
Um, you know, certainly I learned a lot in this conversation, and I'm sure many of our viewers will as well in terms of, you know, the opportunity that's here, you know, before uh, before them in terms of, like I said in my opening remarks, um, you know, this is an opportunity that I think a lot of companies have that are, perhaps they've overlooked in the past. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something that I think the more companies know about it and understand how to go about it, I think it's uh, beneficial for, you know, for everyone. So, you know, Jennifer, Zach, uh, uh, Tom, again, thank you very much for uh, making the time to be with us today and, and sharing your story. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you Thanks for having us. Yeah. Great. I want to thank those of you that joined us. Uh, if you're watching this episode on demand, either at the Transportation Warehousing Optimization website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question for any of our uh, guests today, uh, you can post it there. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. And uh, again, thank you and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.